Dear colleagues, I am Filippo Crea, professor of cardiology at the Catholic University in Rome, and I am the new editor-in-chief of the European Art Journal. In the journal, we will have a brand new section on health politics and economics. Today, I have the extraordinary privilege of sitting with one of the most important and influential men on earth, Professor Draghi, past president of the Central European Bank. Uh, uh, Professor Draghi, thank you for accepting our invitation. We are really grateful. And I have a first uh, rather personal question for you. Cardiologists are interested in stress. How stressful is to be president of the Central European Bank? Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Crea. Um, I think that uh, it's stressful like any other job which entails responsibility, uh, where uh, words matter. Uh, what you do has consequences upon millions of people. But there are many other jobs like that. And uh, so it's nothing special in, uh, in having that job rather, rather than others. Now, uh, I now say something that I should be careful about saying, but in my view, um, the stress is stressful depending on how stressed you are. So in other words, what, what, what I think is important is not the objective content of a job in terms of stress, but how, you, how one lives through that. Well, but doctors deal with one patient. You say you deal with millions of persons. So I think this is a bit stronger emotion, perhaps. Well, I don't know, because the stakes are, uh, are I think, are higher in medicine. Let's come uh, now uh, to medicine. Uh, doctors are between Scylla and Charybdis. Our administrators ask us to spend less but treatments are increasingly more expensive. Where is the sweet spot? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to say, but uh, one, one, one perception I have, maybe, 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 uh, it's not, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but the perception I have is that this sweet spot has moved a lot over recent time. In other words, people have understood, and when I'm, when I'm saying people, I think everybody has understood that we should spend much more in health and uh, in everything that concerns health. And, um, and we have to sort of, you, you, you see this, you read this everywhere, I mean, that the people think that they should change models. And certainly that's important uh, because the catastrophe of the COVID-19 has shown that all of us were not very prepared at the beginning and part of this lack of preparation had to do with the drawbacks of uh, our infrastructure. Uh, so the message is that all countries will spend more, much more. And so it's moved now from, uh, I would say, from pure efficiency to efficiency and robustness, uh, ability to withstand uh, mass, uh, mass problems uh, and, and other measures of, uh, of preparation that uh, I think you are better equipped to judge. You're saying that paradoxically the uh, COVID experience will uh, make public health stronger? Absolutely. Absolutely. And do you think that politicians are ready are prepared to this uh, new way of action? Well, you should ask them. <laughs> okay. <That's laughs> Good point. But uh, your message is very clear. Now, coming to, to COVID, how can a doctor help reducing the detrimental impact of this uh, terrible pandemic on uh, productivity? Well, doctors have helped a lot. I think uh, they, they, they really uh, they were crucial. Uh, they, uh, I think they, they did their utmost. What uh, is uh, now perhaps needed is uh, a different uh, sort of infrastructure, a different uh, logistics. Uh, a different way of conceive, uh, of conceive healthcare. In other words, to be ready to uh, mass problems rather than only curing individual cases or uh, single patient cases. But doctors have done enormous job. A and this is true for all countries, really. 
And they have also changed the way in, in the midst of the problem. They did one of the most difficult things, which was to change continuously, adapting their jobs and the way of seeing things to the developments, in, to the dramatic developments that were taking place. So doctors have done their job uh, appropriately. You oh. promote them. Oh, yeah. Well, they don't need me I mean, to, to, to be promoted. I think they did a wonderful job. It's probably the ones who did the best job of all. Well, thank you for your appreciation um, as, uh, as doctor and really flattered. Thank you. <laughs> no, no. Uh, now, COVID again, what do you think will be the impact of COVID on uh, European economy? It's hard to predict uh, in the literal sense, in the sense that at the beginning of COVID, or say around February or March, we were, uh, we were thinking that um, the catastrophe would be, would be truly uh, dramatic. And in fact, in, if I'm not mistaken, in the second quarter of this year, the, the GDP, which is a measure of economic activity. Can you say GDP? GDP, what it is? gross domestic product, which is a measure of the measure of economic activity, uh, dropped uh, as much as uh, it did drop uh, in say in the, in the worst part of the Second World War for the major countries fighting the war. So it give you gives you a sense of of how dramatic that was. But but then there was a, a bounce back, which uh, all in all was better than uh, most people expected. Um, so uh, what's going to happen is uh, probably is uh, like, uh, it will follow like I think a square root sort of uh, diagram where it drops a lot, then it goes back. The issue is where you, do, where you draw the other line, it's the same level as before or below. We think below and not much below, but below, and then stay flat for quite a long time. But the point is, really, so much of this answer depends on when a vaccine will be, will be found, will be discovered. The discovery of the vaccine eliminates a lot of the uncertainty that's, uh, that, that is uh, hanging over us now. And, um, and uh, the uncertainty is what uh, keeps investment, private investment, and even consumption low. Uh, so we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot of, uh, a lot, uh, very little private investment, depressed consumption levels, and uh, uh, at the same time, governments actually did the right answer, gave the right answer. They all expanded government expenditure, government debt, so that um, they tried to soften the impact uh, of the sudden closures of most of the economic activity. And, uh, and now, of course, comes the time of the difficult choices because some of these activities will not start again. Others will actually uh, more or less start as they were before. And others yet are actually growing very fast give you an idea, the, um, all the tech companies are expanding and their values are growing at a really significant rate. The rest of the economy and the rest of the stocks also of the rest of the economy are not. And, and so the, but the average of the two in some countries like the United States has been positive. So, it's, uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's hard to say because much of the adaptation depends on when the virus will be, the, the vaccine will be discovered. Well, we call it uh, remodeling in cardiology. Yeah. So, the, the uh, economy is, is remodeling based on this, on what's happening. Yes. This is the, the message. I think so, but the extent of this remodeling is uh, still in its going, in its making. Now, uh, let's assume that the vaccine will come in a year next summer, which is perhaps a realistic expectation. You think that the current difficulties are tolerable for the economy for one more year? Well, uh, the, the action, uh, well, first of all, the vaccine may be found in a year. The problem is when it's going to be mass distributed to everybody in the world. And I think the consequences depend on that uh, as well. 
As a second point is that uh, the, the measures that, uh, that most governments have followed was to increase subsidies, increase subsidies to workers first and foremost to protect their income and increase subsidies to firms to make sure that uh, the workers would not get uh, unemployed and poor and the firms would not shut down uh, because of uh, lack of demand, lack of consumption. And uh, how long will this last? We never, see, we never saw such amount of debt since the Second World War. So it's, uh, that, that's the answer. How, for how long uh, this newly created debt will be sustainable? And that depends essentially on uh, how the interest rates will behave, and so far they've been extremely low but also about a, a, a perception of how this debt is being used. Is it being used for productive purposes or is it being used for uh, wasteful purposes? I think that's an important distinction. How can you distinguish between the two? Well, the uh, productive purposes, for example, that's what I, I think said about a couple of days ago, um, most of this debt will not be repaid by you or me. It will be paid back by people who are very young today. So uh, they will have this huge task of finding the resources to pay back this debt. So one, one thing, the very, in my view, the first thing we should do is to invest in their education to uh, as much as we can and as well as we can with a lot of intelligence to make sure that they will be prepared for this new society and they will not have to sacrifice other important values because they have to pay back the debt. So it's, uh, th that's one thing, but in general I think we've neglected education and uh, I think that uh, to neglect the education for, for a young person is to deprive her or him of his future or her future. And this is one of the worst forms of inequality. So I think we have, in a sense, a moral task here. And so that's one example of productive use of the debt, education. Others are, are in a sense, they figure prominently in the list of all government's agendas, like digitalization, climate change, and, so, and there are others as well. Uh, productive infrastructures and so on. The, the other thing is, uh, you know, so one last consideration here is that in so doing, the government creates jobs. So if this process is, uh, is, is fast and, uh, and significant, it's true that the subsidies will have to go down, but at the same time new jobs are being created. So I think it's very good if the government succeeds in giving jobs and taking out subsidies. And again, it's especially good for the young people. Very, very clear. One last question. Uh, you've been discussing this short-term remodeling of the economy. Uh, what about the long-term remodeling? I don't want it to be pessimistic, but if you will have a, a pandemic in five years, in ten years, do you think that this experience will also impact long-term remodeling of the economy? Well, the, uh, it, again, you are, you are asking all very difficult questions. So of it's course, just, just it's my tradition. <laughs> that's, uh, but, but, uh, but from what we've seen, for example, on the state of preparation that some Asian countries had, with respect to the pandemia, and we compare it with our state of preparation, we have to conclude that they were better prepared. And they were better prepared because they had a previous experience with SARS. And so uh, I think we'll certainly treasure, unfortunately, it's, it's, it's sort of a kind of a wrong word, but it's a, treasure this experience to change. We'll change, we'll change first of all, health, that's what the health policy is, but we'll also change our behaviors. We are going to be much more careful. I think social distancing has been uh, now pretty much accepted by most people, let's put it this way. But the other thing is that if we want to restart the economy in, at, at a significant level, even while a vaccine is not yet being discovered, 
we um, need to be able to do mass testing. And the tracing can't be done if we don't test. So it has to be, these two things must become everyday policy everywhere. And I think that's essential because if you take, take an example of a factory where you have hundreds of workers and, um, and they are sure, they feel okay if they know they have been tested and no case is found. And, and so and they work. So that's, uh, and that works for everybody, for shops and so on, restaurants and so on. Well, <clears throat> I wish to thank you for sharing with us your thoughts into this difficult period. I'm optimistic and I'm sure you're optimistic as well. I think we can both be optimistic. I think we both think that, uh, that optimism, resilience, trust in science, uh, with global teamwork, uh, and of course, with your wise suggestions, we will overcome this difficult time. Thank you again for your participation. You're most welcome, Professor Crea.